Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our online combined Sunday school classes, the Agape class and the Young Men's Bible class, two of our larger adult Sunday school classes here at First Presbyterian Church on North Elm Street at Fisher Park near downtown Greensboro. I'm Lane Reidenhauer, and I lead the hymn singing for the Young Men's Bible class, and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us as we gather together here online today for worship and study on this Reformation Sunday, Sunday, October 31st. Our Sunday School teacher, Professor Sandy Gravid, is continuing her series on the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Sandy will join us in just a few moments. Today, the Reverend Neil Donovan will be preaching in our sanctuary service at 11 o'clock as well as our 9 o'clock rejoice service. He'll be speaking to, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, which frankly is good advice for any day. Let's sing a hymn together this morning. Our hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It was written by Edwin Hatch, who was an English theologian and an authority on the early church. Several online sources make note of the fact that he used such simple language in this hymn, but it's quite obvious that he has a very deep understanding of Scripture. This text is really a prayer for renewal by God's Spirit, a renewal that's to be expressed in a life of love and in purity of heart and will, as mentioned in the verses of the hymn. In both the Hebrew and the Greek texts, the word for spirit is the same word that's used for wind, breath, and air. Thus, in this text, the Spirit of God is referred to as the breath of God. As always, I'll put the words up on the screen for you and invite you to sing along with me. Breathe on me, breath of God. In her novel, Paradise, Toni Morrison's character, the Reverend Senior Pulliam, is giving a wedding sermon. Some of what his character says is widely quoted in internet memes as profound words about love. But in the context of the story, the congregation does not receive his words well. Here is part of what he has to say. Love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it is easy, you're a fool. If you think it is natural, you are blind. It is a learned application without reason or motive except that it is God. 
You do not deserve love regardless of the suffering you have endured. You do not deserve love because somebody did you wrong. You do not deserve love just because you want it. You can only earn by practice and careful contemplations the right to express it and you have to learn how to accept it. If we had time to look at the whole sermon he preaches, you would find this minister drawing a contrast between notions of romantic love and divine love. You would also see him talking about the actual practice of love. He is preaching something many of us do not want to say. That love is hard work and you have to make an effort at both giving and receiving it. Why then the silent reaction of the gathered community? Well, likely for some, his words about love go against what they believe. For others, it's all about the timing. It's the celebration of a wedding, after all. Maybe these aren't the most appropriate words. That's not our topic for today. Rather, for me, the reason that I bring these words to the forefront is because Morrison reminds me of the passage that we come to in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul, too, is talking about love. And like Pastor Pulliam, he is not pulling any punches. While his words are shaped in such a way that they have a ring of truth to it, they still do not go over well in all likelihood with the recipients or at least some of them in his audience. I am going to start with what Paul says in verses 11 to 13 and then I'm going to work backwards. Right now, I'm going to put on your screen the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, and my literal translation of those words. Let me read the New Revised Standard Version. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. These words are somewhat circuitously declaring love, but there is both an immediate and a more expanded context in which they are being heard that we need to grasp in order to understand what Paul is communicating in this passage. Immediately, Paul is talking about the connection between the words he has spoken to this community and the love he and his team have for the people. However, you will recall from earlier in the series that Paul's words to the people of Corinth, words spoken in person at various times and words written in other previous letters have been a source of pain for this group. His words have stung the people they have caused both hurt and hard feelings. Thus, Paul might not be coming across as the loving figure he presents to all involved. Additionally, while he says he is speaking from a place of love, he does something else that could rub some folks the wrong way. He talks about the group as if they were children, and he places responsibility on them for being closed off. For many recipients, this phrasing can come across as condescending, especially when it is paired with the idea that they are the resistant ones. It's like Paul is saying they are stubborn children, unwilling to go against what is just a gut level reaction and open themselves up, give way from their stubbornness to Paul and his team. Still, I want to go back and try to offer a more sympathetic reading of Paul's words. To accomplish that, I want to go back and start by looking at a more distant context beginning in verse 3. I want to see how Paul characterizes his ministry and consider whether it offers a description of love that might still have 
some utility for us in terms of understanding what love means in a Christian context. Paul opens with a simple premise. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. For him, the starting point for everything that he and his team were and are about is rather easy to grasp. He claims that they have always behaved in a way with which no one should be able to find fault. There should be nothing in their efforts that would trip anyone up. Stop and consider what he is saying, because if you give it some thought, you will realize it again pushes his audience. It is demanding that they take some responsibility for what has unfolded negatively between them. He is asking his recipients to think about whether they are, like many of us, quick to look for fault outside of themselves when any misstep, any bump in the road happens. Could this be like a case of when a student does not perform well and the blame gets assigned to the teacher? Or if a child misbehaves, the finger often gets pointed at the parent? Paul and his team have felt the brunt of this community's anger and frustration and hurt, and they have felt stung by it. Thus, in his own defense, he is asking this community to look at what it is that commends him and his team to be seen as servants of God, to be thought about as ones whose hearts are open, whose affections are on display. Look at the attributes that he unfurls at this point. Endurance starts the list. This term, hupomone, is from two Greek words, and it means to remain under. Paul is saying that no matter what challenges have come their way, the team has been constant. They have hung in there with the Corinthians and never given up. And boy, have there been challenges. When you are reading this passage, and it is rapid fire, things tend to move in groups of three at first, and thus I'm going to look at them that way as well, and then shift when it shifts. He says, there have been afflictions. This word means pressure, constriction, or being hemmed in by circumstances when there seemed to be little choice other than to simply make your way through. He says there have been hardships. This is a word that means things are pressing in, indicating something that cannot be ignored. And he throws in calamities. Here we have more of an internal distress, but also with notes of being confined or boxed in. When you look at these three things together, we see that Paul is describing a situation where one feels as if there is no clear path to alleviate the pressure. There's no exit, no escape. It just seems like it's all coming down on you. This is not too much of a stretch because when you are committed to a relationship, you voluntarily choose not to bail out when the going gets rough. Of course you can feel surrounded, encircled, cramped, enveloped, beset, bound, But that's part of living with someone, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, is not just about marriage. We do the same with our children, our siblings, our friends. But this love is about a community. And thus Paul keeps going with the list of what kinds of other things he and his team endured in their ministry. He adds, beatings, imprisonment, riots. In short, there have been real consequences for them and their work in the places where they have traveled. They have put their bodies and their freedom on the line. But there's more. Labors, sleepless nights, hunger. It is, by his reckoning, work that wears you out to the point of exhaustion, offers little respite, and might mean that you go at it so hard that you give up things like rest 
or the possibility of the nourishment you need to keep you going. All of us at some point have done work like this out of love or out of dedication. It could be those first few weeks with a new baby, or it might be trying to hold it together when someone in the family is facing illness or some other crisis, or it could be trying to see some work project that you are dedicated to, even if it may be completing a degree, writing a book, to the point where it invades your sleep and means you are doing stupid things like skipping meals. Still, Paul's list is not yet done. Once he gets going, Paul piles it on. He sort of shifts into on what bases are they engaged in the work, and he answers those questions too. He says we do it by purity. This is a word that means chastity or love not expressed sexually. Paul is clear that they are not in it, nor are they looking for the things that satisfy the body. That can be, of course, a temptation when you are dealing with loving people in a community. But he puts that off the table. He says we're doing it by knowledge. It's a word that also means wisdom. That is, they are committed to something that they know reliably. He says it is in patience or in forbearing or long-suffering. In other words, it's not love that's in a hurry. It can bide its time. And he says here too, adding a fourth, in kindness, which is in goodness or uprightness. That is something that is the right thing in the right situation in a way that demonstrates the good. For Paul, this list naturally leads in to what provides the foundation for everything that they are doing, that demonstrates that they are in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love and in truthful speech. He's pushing here to get us to the divine. And he adds one more thing. And the power of God. That is, this is what fuels their ministry. What does the power of God demonstrated look like? It gives them weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. In simple terms, he feels equipped for the effort that they are making. But there is still yet more. What is the terrain on which they are working? And by this, what I mean is what do we see happening in the world as they move along? Well, first of all, he says, it is in honor and dishonor. If I were actually translating, I would say through glory and dishonor. That is, Paul is completely aware that sometimes people will laud you and respect you, and at other times you find yourself humiliated or degraded. He continues, this says in ill repute and good repute, I would choose through defamation and praise. Sometimes Paul is telling us you are spoken about in ways that are harmful and communicate something negative about you, while at other times people will vouch for your good name. Are you tired yet? Well, Paul isn't because he is not quite wrapped up. He wants to continue with this list of apparent contradictions that this work brings out in the world. He says, we are treated as imposters and yet are true. What he means is that there will be people who will see you hear you, interact with you, and they will still make accusations that you are fake, you're a swindler, you're a snake oil salesperson, you are not what you seem to be. 
But Paul indicates here, that can't shake you. You have to hold steadfast to the knowledge that you are the genuine article. His next phrase is, as unknown and yet are well known. Even more, he's telling us, people can choose to be willfully ignorant of who you are and what you are offering. That's what this unknown word means, willfully ignorant. And they can do that even if they are fully acquainted with who and what you are. That is, there's nothing to hide. It's all on display. And they're going to choose sometimes not to recognize it, not to acknowledge it. Then he gets to a really interesting one. As dying, and see, or and behold, we are alive. Here, what he's trying to get at is that people will say or people will look at you and think they see something that is in decay, something that is on its way to wrapping up. But he says, check it out. And that is the addition of an imperative. He is adjuring them to recognize telling himself, claiming something that is central to Christianity. We are alive. There is a vitality that is at the core of who they are. A living presence. He's not done yet. Look at these last ones. As punished and yet not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing everything. These things are exactly how they are alive. These things are what it means to be alive. They're not dead. They manage, even in the worst of times, to see the positive. They don't need material things. They have enough to spread amongst themselves. They feel as if the whole world is theirs. This is, in many ways, Paul's fullest description of what it means to live in a way that is loving. I'll grant you, it might not seem to be such an obvious leap at first. But Paul even gives us a metaphor that helps us make that transition. He talks about being a parent. To help that stick in my mind, I couldn't help but think of the humorous Irma Bombeck, who had this piece entitled, When God Created Mothers. It is way too long to go through word by word here. But it is a conversation, she imagines, between God and an angel when God is in the process of creating a mother, a figure that God calls, quote, something so close to myself. A few of the highlights from her work will help illustrate what Paul is saying with this catalog of both positives and negatives that he has accumulated here. Bombeck describes God as saying of this woman, she has to be completely washable, but not plastic, have 180 movable parts, all replaceable, run on black coffee and leftovers, have a lap that disappears when she stands up, a kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a disappointed love affair, and six pairs of hands. Then, of course, there are the three pairs of eyes. One pair that sees through closed doors when she asks, what are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. Another here in the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but what she has to know. And of course, the ones here in front that can look at a child when he goofs up and say, I understand and I love you without so much as uttering a word. And then there were a few other qualities mentioned. One who heals herself when she is sick, 
can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger and can get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. But there are still a few other qualities that God tells the angel that this mother will possess. They include reasoning, the ability to compromise, and endurance. It is, however, the conclusion that is striking. The angel God is showing this mother sees a tear, and God says, It's for joy, sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. At this point, the angel declares God a genius. But Bombeck concludes that God somberly says of that tear, I didn't put it there. This message delivered with humor still manages to pack a punch. It is what the Reverend Pulliam was saying about love at the outset. Love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it is easy, you are a fool. If you think it is natural, you are blind. It is a learned application without reason or motive except that it is God. What Paul is trying to say to this community is like what Bombeck is saying about mothers, like what Morrison is saying about love. It's that everything he and his team are doing has been and will be a demonstration of love, whether it looks that way all the time or whether it even feels that way. I think of it like this. Sometimes as children, we do not appreciate the way that our parents love us. And maybe, just maybe, this group is not seeing all that Paul and those with him are doing for this community, doing on the basis of love. And they fail to make that connection because sometimes that love hurts or rankles. But still, more than anything, Paul is trying to get them to see something about God. What is that? Well, I don't think that Paul would fully agree with the Reverend Pulliam. In my understanding of Paul, he would never say that the love of God has to be earned. Period. End of sentence. Indeed, that love for Paul cannot be earned. It just is. But he might give an okay to this idea. Paul is not arguing that all he and his team have gone through make them worthy of the love of this community. And he is not expecting their love just because he so desperately wants it. And no doubt, he might give the nod to this group needing to learn how both to accept and to express love. But for Paul, that acceptance and that expression would come by embracing what is already there and available to them. And to embrace it knowing that love is not easy, that love will not always be pleasant, knowing that love will bring with it great joy and great sorrow, knowing that it will demand more of them than they ever knew they had to give. But for Paul, that roll of the dice is always worth more than any potential downside because Paul believed that in learning to accept love and in learning to express love, we would do something that he talked about in the very first of chapter 6. We would find grace. We would find salvation. We would find God. All we have to do is all that any community had to do. It was what Paul was pleading with the community at Corinth to do. Open wide our hearts. Thank you for your attention, and I will continue with this series for one more month in November.